Hello, welcome you all again to the lecture series in political theory. You know, I am Professor H. Sri Khan. So far, I have given 15 YouTube lectures on different themes in Marxian political theory. Although it is not directly related to political theory, today I thought uh, I should discuss Marxian dialectics or what came to be known in short as dialectical materialism. There is a reason for it. When we discuss political ideas of uh, eminent uh, persons like uh, J.S. Mill, Rousseau, Machiavelli, Aristotle or Plato, we should keep in mind that they are not just political thinkers. They are all great philosophers. Their political ideas are integral part of their world outlook. One cannot understand why they have arrived at a particular understanding of politics unless we also know their philosophical perspective. That is true of Marx, Marxist and Marxist political theory as well. We will have a better grasp over Marxist political theory if we also know the essence of uh, Marxist philosophy of uh, materialist dialectics uh, or dialectical materialism. You know, the discussion on Marxist dialectics is found in different classical Marxist works such as the German ideology, anti-during Ludwig Feuerbach and the end of uh, classical German philosophy, materialism and imperial criticism, etc. You know, this Marxian dialectics is the result of uh, the philosophical engagements of Marx, Engels and then Lenin with the greatest minds of their times. Unless we know the whole context, it will be difficult for most of us uh, to make sense of uh, uh, the debates. But this revolutionary philosophy that they have given birth to becomes toothless unless it reaches out to the masses. Stalin and Mao understood this and hence they started writing uh, uh, in a language that could be understood uh, by the masses. However, I tell you my, from my own experience that we understand Marxian dialectics better if we get the opportunity to attend political classes uh, or workshops engaged by scholar activists who are thorough with the theory and also practice Marxism in their day-to-day -day lives. My talk on Marxist dialectics or dialectical materialism will be based on what I learned uh, from such political classes and workshops when I was doing my post-graduation. Before I come to Marxian philosophical outlook, let me start with the philosophy in general. I consider philosophy as a world outlook, an approach to understand the universal relations. Philosophy enables us to understand both microcosm and also macrocosm in more general terms. 
while disciplines like political science, economics, physics, biology, mathematics, uh, they all look at particular aspects of the material world. Philosophy helps us to comprehend the totality of uh, all its relations and uh, contradictions. The philosophers try to make sense of the world that we live in by interpreting it from their philosophical outlook. Human history produced uh, several philosophers and different philosophies. They all can be classified into two schools of thought, the idealist school and the materialist school. First let me take uh, the idealist school. The idealist school of philosophy assumes that idea is primary and matter is secondary. To all idealist philosophers, idea is independent of matter and it is out of idea that the matter emerged. This idea that we call, we can call it as God or some supernatural power or spirit or geest. They consider that this idea is eternal, omnipotent and omnipresent. Idea determines the form and accounts for the changes in the matter. To them, matter is only something temporary and uh, it can be destroyed. But idea is something permanent. It is the truth. Hence, the object of our knowledge is to understand the nature, dynamics and manifestations of uh, idea in all its forms. Many ancient philosophers, Greek, Roman or Indian, looked at idea mostly as unchanging form, eternal, like Plato's forms. Matter changes, but idea is something that never changes. But this conception of an unchanging idea went, underwent a change with Hegel, who spoke about ever-expanding idea or spirit. Unlike the old idealists, who thought idea is always static, matter changes but idea remains what it is. Hegel said that even idea expands from lower to higher forms and it is changing. Uh, eternally, it is not, it is never static, it is uh, constantly changing. I will talk more about Hegel after some time. Now let us come to the uh, uh, materialist school. You know, alongside idealist school of philosophy, we also have its opposite, the materialist school. We sometimes assume that this materialist school is something which came up only in recent years. It is not so. There were philosophers who upheld materialist tradition even during the heydays of uh, Greek philosophy. Even in ancient India, 
we see Charvaka or Buddha upholding rational and materialist values and outlook. This materialist tradition, what does it say? It says that matter is primary and idea is secondary. Everything in this universe is material and there is nothing super or supranatural about idea. You have read in uh, the school textbooks, dialectics also say, mat uh, sorry, materialism also says, Matter is neither created nor destroyed. It only changes forms. The world that we live in is the real world. There is no world outside this material world. So the object of our knowledge is the material world that we live in. This materialist tradition passed through different stages. Primitive materialists of ancient times, they challenged many aspects of the idealist traditions of that time. They, but they tried their best to give an account of the laws governing the development or changes in this material world. But they failed as they did not have sufficient knowledge to explain the mysteries of the universe. Consequently, idealist tradition dominated philosophy during the medieval period both in the West and also in India. However, development of science and technology that followed Renaissance and Industrial Revolution revived the materialist tradition. Scientists like Newton, Kepler, Darwin, Dalton, etc. They revolutionized our understanding of the matter and the universe and paved the way for what came to be known as a mechanical materialist tradition. Taking inspiration from the discoveries and inventions of the time, many political philosophers like Hobbes, Locke, J.S. Mill, etc attempted to explain politics based on the then understanding of the universe, nature, society and man. They try to account for the causes of motion and developed methodology for understanding the material reality. Their theories laid the foundations for a bourgeois humanism and this bourgeois humanism or mechanical materialism reached its zenith in the ideas of a Feuerbach in Germany. So when Marx and Engels started their political and philosophical work they were under the shadow of these two great Jains, Hegel and Feuerbach, who represented the development of highest forms of idealist and materialist traditions respectively. Hegel was the one to say that nothing is static, everything is dynamic, everything is changing. And he tried to explain uh, the motion uh, by 
developing the principles of dialectics. He found out that the motion is the result of uh, contradictions of the opposites. You know, in short, we always see thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, but much more than that. Hmm? And he, but the problem with him was that he believed that, that this dialectics operate basically in the field of idea resulting in continuous development of idea from lower to higher stages. As a reflection or as realization of the goals of this idea or spirit, the material world also changes from one stage to another stage, from family to civil society to ultimately to the state. To Hegel, the state was like the march of God on the earth. It is, it is the highest uh, realization or essence of the spirit to which everybody should submit. He glorified the uh, German state and argued that freedom exists in following the dictates of the state. His ideas rationalized the authoritarian and dictatorial Prussian state. In contrast, the mechanical materialist tradition, which re reached its culmination with Feuerbach, And Feuerbach was known for his interpretation of God as reification of man. That is, man separated from man. His understanding was that it was man who created God in his own image. All the qualities that we attribute to God as the most beautiful, the most merciful, uh, the strongest, uh, the uh, symbol of love and all the hatch. He says they are all nothing but human qualities. They make no sense to any other animals or inanimate things. It is only the human qualities we take it out and the best of them we attribute to God and we start worshipping that God. So Feuerbach actually replaced God by man by stating that God is only a creation of man. It is not man, sorry, it is uh, uh, not that God created man, rather it is man who created God. So he wanted to replace religion by humanism. But there were limitations in his thought. He represented the belief in unchanging human nature. He sought to understand human essence in abstract individual. By abstracting individual from the society and social relations. Like any other individualist. His materialism like other forms of materialism overlooked the significance of a human praxis in making of the objective world that we live in. He constructs a society which has no history 
and has no future. Consequently, his humanism itself turns into a form of a oppressive uh, uh, religion. Eh? Humanism be uh, becomes a kind of a godless religion. Marx and Engels interrogated uh, these philosophical contributions of both uh, uh, Hegel and Feuerbach. While evaluating the, their contributions, Marx and Engels also realized that neither Hegelian dialectics nor Feuerbachian materialism could be accepted uncritically. They understood the positive aspects of uh, both these, these great philosophers, Hegel and Feuerbach. Hmm? But uh, they understood that there is a need to move beyond these philosophers and their philosophical hmm, outlooks. Taking materialist essence from uh, Feuerbach and principles of dialectics from Hegel, Marx and Engels developed a new philosophical approach called materialist dialectics or dialectical materialism. The new philosophical approach sheds off the idealist tradition of Hegel and also overcomes the limitations of a mechanical materialism or of Feuerbach. Introducing this uh, Marxian dialectical approach, uh, Stalin writes in his uh, book Dialectical Materialism. It is called dialectical materialism because its approach to the phenomena of nature, its method of studying and apprehending them, is dialectical, while its interpretation of the phenomena of nature, its conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialistic. Now with this basic understanding, now let us look at uh, the fundamental premises of uh, Marxian dialectics. According to dialectical materialism, everything in this universe is material. There is nothing which is supranatural or supernatural. Matter pervades everywhere and it is interconnected. It has no end nor beginning. You can create a particular matter out of some other matter, but matter as a whole can neither be created nor destroyed. It only changes forms. The most important premise of uh, the dialectical materialism is that matter or this material world is never static. It is always in motion. It is in the process of uh, change and development. Matter and motion they are complementary. There is no matter without motion and there is no motion without matter. When you say motion, it is always a motion of a particular matter. Yes, forms of motion may differ from 
one form of matter to another. But uh, there is no matter in this universe which does not uh, undergo motion of certain forms. Another aspect of this materialist dialectics is that it says matter exists in space and time. You know, all matter occupies some space. When we say space, the space is something occupied by some form of matter, some of the other form of matter. There is no empty space anywhere in this universe. The word empty space is relative. A space may be empty of particular matter, but some form of matter known or unknown to us exists even there. For example, if I say, is there anything? This is empty space. We can tell. It is not really empty. There may be no solid liquid matter here, but there is air, there is dust, which we may not be able to see, but it is very much there. Hmm? As such, there is nothing called empty space. Space means space occupied by some or the other form of matter. So is time. There is nothing called absolute time. Capital T. You know, in uh, B. R. Chopra's Mahabharata serial, it all starts with the uh, someone uh, called time, Carl. He comes and tells the story of Mahabharata. He says, I am Carl, time. This is what I have seen. I narrate the story of Mahabharata to you. In this, it is, it gives an impression that time is independent of uh, the material world, outside the material world outside uh, uh, the matter. But it is dialectic says there is nothing uh, uh, like that. When you say time, it always refers uh, to the time of a given matter. And it is relative. Lifetime of amoeba is not the same as the lifetime of a human being. Time taken by earth to revolve around the sun eh, is not the same as the time taken by Saturn to revolve around the sun. So Saturn's one year and our one year are different. A day means 24 hours for us living on the earth, but it will not be the same eh, eh, in other planets. In other words, time and space are conditions of existence of matter. They do not exist outside matter. Then the question comes, if everything is matter, what about idea or consciousness? Marxism says that there is nothing mystical about the idea. Idea with big I does not exist. Ideas are something that are the product of human thinking. 
ideas emanate when human mind interacts with the material surroundings. But what is this mind? Mind is a part of the human brain which is nothing but an advanced form of organic matter that has come into existence in course of uh, the evolution of the human species. It means matter thinks matter. All ideas are also material. Human mind cannot think of anything that does not exist in this material world in some crude forms. So if you go by this logic, even God, the idea of God is also a human idea. It emerged under particular conditions, material condition to serve certain particular material needs. Hmm? As such, uh, uh, this idea is uh, uh, not something uh, uh, which is completely independent of uh, our senses. If you go by this logic, then what is consciousness? Is there something called consciousness with capital C? Marxism says consciousness is means it's a human consciousness. You know, famous uh, mm, saying of Marx, quotation from Marx which says, it is not the consciousness that determines the being, but it is the material being that determines consciousness. Unlike idealists who believe that we get consciousness uh, when we pray, meditate, uh, or look into oneself, uh, etc. Mao said that human consciousness is acquired through human practice at different levels. At the level of production, in class struggle, and in engagements in scholastic activity. It is through all these uh, engagements that we get consciousness about this material world. And when this human consciousness is accompanied by praxis, it can change the material world. So it is not that consciousness has no role to play, it has a role to play. Ideas have important roles to play, provided they have their roots in the real uh, material world that we live in. So when we say ideas or consciousness, hmm, they have significance. But what needs to be remembered is that this idea or human consciousness is also material. Hmm? Now it is time for us to focus on the principles of uh, dialectical materialism. You know, when materialist dialectics uh, does not see motion in a mechanical way as a physical motion of a matter from point to point. Here movement or change of motion is understood in different and complex forms. 
question can be chemical, biological, psychological, sociological, political, economic, uh, depending on uh, the nature of the matter uh, that is in perspective. What guides the motion of uh, matter in all these different uh, varied forms? For that, we need to understand uh, three principles of uh, dialectics. One, quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and vice versa. Second, contradictions and unity of opposites. And third, negation of uh, negations. I give you a brief description of these principles uh, with uh, simple examples uh, that you can relate to. First, we'll take the first principle of materialist dialectics. It says that every change starts with simple and qualitative changes. But at a particular point of time and conditions, quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes, giving birth to new form of matter. For example, when you start boiling water, it becomes hot, hotter. But at a particular temperature, you know, 100 degrees centigrade, water, which is in liquid state, transforms into vapor, attaining gaseous state. So also when you keep water in freeze at 0 degrees centigrade, it turns into ice, acquiring solid state. This is how even evolution of a species took place. Evolution is never simple evolution meaning only quantitative changes. At one point of evolution, this one, you witness a revolution where a particular species completely transforms itself into a new kind of species. So you can see that at particular time, space and conditions, single cell organisms transform into multicellular uh, organism that to more complicated uh, life forms into aquatic creatures, amphibians, invertebrates, tubertebrates, primates and homo sapiens. These principles works even in our human thought. When one gets exposed to new ideas, good or bad, at one point individual transforms into entirely different kind of person with new perspective and practice. This qualitative changes facilitates new form of quantitative changes and this process continues. Hmm? And with uh, new kinds of uh, but, uh, changes unknown to us. So now I come to the second principle of materialist dialectics, contradictions and unity of opposites. Lenin considers it as the essence of Marxian dialectics. Hence, uh, we need to focus more on uh, uh, this second principle. According to this principle, 
every form of matter, big or small, consists of some other matter or some other particles. As a result, there is contradiction in every form of matter. There is no matter in the universe which exists without contradictions. Contradictions is the mode of existence of matter. When you say matter, there will be contradictions. Why there will be contradiction? Because any form of matter is made up of some other matters and there is a contradiction among those particles. There was a time when the scientists thought atom is the smallest particle. But in course of time we understood that uh, uh, atom which itself means one which cannot be cut. Atom can also be cut because atom itself is composed of some other particles, protons, neutrons uh, and electrons. And now the scientists say even these protons, electrons and neutrons are not uh, the final. They themselves have some other particles. And because there are so many particles within particles, there is, there are contradictions. As a result of contradiction, you see motion. But these contradictions uh, can be of two kinds. Uh, we can, they say, one is internal contradictions and the other external contradictions. And both these internal and external contradictions are needed for any kind of motion or a change. But dialectical materialism says of these two, the internal contradictions uh, are primary. They are the driving force of change. Whereas external contradictions or conditions of change. They are needed, no doubt, they help, facilitate, activate the process of change. But more important are the internal contradictions. This can be explained with simple examples. You know, as a teacher, I am an external force uh, trying to make you understand dialectics. All of you can listen to me. But how many of, uh, how much of what I teach you are able to understand differs from person to person. It depends on the contradictions within you. with how much of attention you are listening to me mm -hmm. and how much you could grasp. That differs from uh, one student to another student. It will not be same uh, for all. Though I as an external force is same for all of you. Now take another example, which I was told Mao used to explain uh, with it to the illiterate uh, uh, peasants. You know, when a hen sits on the egg and hatches it for days, one day the egg breaks and a chicken comes out. But suppose the same hen hits on a stone for any number of hours or days. Will the stone break and the chicken comes out? 
you know the answer. Why it will not come out? Because the internal contradictions in the egg and the stone are different. Mao also brought to light another dimension of the contradictions. Depending on the time and space, contradictions can be antagonistic or non-antagonistic. Generally, you know, the moment we say contradictions, we only see in terms of uh, uh, antagonistic contradictions. Uh, about, uh, but it need not be always. There can also be non-antagonistic contradictions. While some contradictions are irreconcilable, some contradictions can be complementary. But the nature of contradictions may change in course of time. What is today non-antagonistic contradiction may turn into antagonistic and vice versa is also possible. For example, on the eve of the November Revolution in Russia, the contradictions between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, they were antagonistic contradictions. But in New Democratic Revolution, the contradictions between the national bourgeoisie and the proletariat was non-antagonistic. But the, at the time of the Cultural Revolution, that non-antagonistic contradiction turned into antagonistic contradiction. Mao also talks of uh, two aspects of uh, contradictions and their changing dynamics. For example, in capitalist society, uh, there is a capitalist class that we say capitalist contradictions. Uh, in that, there is a capitalist class uh, on one side and the working class on the other. But which aspect of these contradictions remains stronger depends on time and space. The position of the aspects eh, may change. The capitalist class is powerful today, but the proletariat may emerge powerful uh, after a few uh, years or decades. This is about the contradictions. But when I told you, I said these contradictions and unity of opposites. Let me understand the second part of this uh, second principle that is the unity of uh, opposites it brings out it brings to our notice uh, the fact that although there are contradictions in every form of matter the contradiction need not lead to breakup although there are contradictions there is also unity. It is that unity which gives form to the matter. In atom, there is contradiction between electrons and protons. But there is also unity. Hence the atom exists. So also North Pole and South Pole of the magnet are a positive and negative in the electricity. Even in social relations, there exists contradiction between the working class and the capitalist class. But there is also unity. That is what enables the existence of a capitalist society. But what Marxism tells is that while the unity is temporary, the contradictions are permanent. Unity is temporary and the contradictions are permanent. 
the existence of unity does not negate eh, that there is no contradictions. Hmm? There is a family, but the husband and wife, eh, there is a contradiction between the two, but there is a family also. So both go together, family and contradiction hmm? uh, between wife and husband. So unity does not negate the existence of contradictions, which is uh, the motive force for any motion or change. This is the uh, second principle of uh, uh, which we say contradictions and unity of opposites. Now let me come to the last principles of uh, dialectical materialism. That is negation of negation. This principle says that anything that comes into existence comes by negating some other thing. But what comes into existence carries within itself the germs of uh, its own destruction. You know Shakespeare's dialogue Nothing comes out of nothing. Coming into being of any matter necessitate destruction of some other. You, something should disappear for some other thing to appear. Coming into being of any matter necessitate destruction of some other. But that which takes birth will also get destroyed one day because of uh, its own internal contradictions. Because it has within itself the germs of its own destruction. I give you simple examples to substantiate this principle. When you sow the seeds and pour water, one day the seed breaks and a sapling comes out. For sapling to come out, the seed should get destroyed. And this sapling grows in course of time, becomes a tree and has its own flowers uh, and gives fruits and produces more seeds. But the same tree will die one day. Even though there is no woodcutter eh, who cuts it. Similarly, a child is born out of uh, the womb of a mother. It cannot remain in the womb forever. It comes out. It grows, becomes adult, marries, have children, then become old and one day dies. Not necessarily because of any accident or murder, because of the internal mechanisms. Within everyone there are germs which will destroy it, uh, that life, giving birth to a new form of uh, matter. Why that happens? Because within every form of matter that comes into existence, eh, it carries within itself the germs of its own destruction, which destroys it one day, giving birth to new 
form of matter. The destruction or death here is relative. That is what you understand. Understand. One form of matter or material existence, it disappears, it gets destroyed or it dies, but giving birth to a new form of matter. So, as the saying goes, uh, you know, in English, in English there is a saying, eh? you cannot have the cake and eat it too. If you have the, if you want to eat the cake, then the cake will not be there. You go, don't say, I want to have the cake and at the same time eh, have the satisfaction of eating it also. When you eat the cake, cake will not be there. Hmm? So, once something disappears, some other thing appears. No form of matter continue to, continues to exist in the same form eternally. What comes into existence at one point has to exist some other day, some day, giving space to some other form of material existence. This is the third principle of negation of negation. Hope now you understood uh, the three principles of uh, dialectical materialism. You know these three general principles of uh, dialectics uh, operate simultaneously in all forms of uh, material existence. They determine its nature, dynamics, change and transformation. Depending on the nature of the disciplines, these principles take uh, different uh, uh, forms as particular laws. One working in uh, particular disciplines, be it uh, physics, chemistry, economics or sociology, should be thorough with the laws that operate in each discipline or each form of matter. But at the same time, one should not ignore that these general principles uh, operate in all forms of matter living or non-living, okay? big or small, in individual or in the society. According to Marxian dialectics, since everything is material and every form of matter is guided by particular laws, or the general principles of uh, dialectics, it is very much possible to understand the universe. Hence, unlike Immanuel Kant, who believed that there are certain things in the world which are knowable and certain things which are unknowable, Marxism advocates that world is knowable. Although, at a given point of time, there always remains certain things which are unknown. What it means? It means since there is nothing mystical about the material world, it is possible to know everything when we understand the laws and principles guiding the particular forms of the material existence. There always remains, but there always remains something which is unknown or unknowable because the world is st not static and it is changing. Understand the difference between unknown and unknowable. What Marxism says is that there will be certain things which are not known today, but the human beings 
can know it, can know them in course of time. As such, there is nothing called unknowable. This is all what I have to say about uh, materialist dialectics or dialectical materialism. Unlike idealism and mechanical materialism, Marxian dialectics demystifies all forms of uh, material existence and guides human action. Hence the Marxists make dialectical materialism as the philosophical approach of the proletariat, for it enables them to understand the nature of human society and human thinking in a more objective way and empowers them with the knowledge that facilitates revolution. Before I end, let me suggest you some more readings if you are interested to know more about uh, Marxian dialectics or dialectical materialism. I have already indicated to you some of the classical Marxist works uh, that discuss uh, materialist dialectics. Since they are difficult to understand, I su suggest you to start with uh, Stalin's piece dialectical and historical materialism which you will find in uh, the his volume problems of uh, leninism you can also read mabo setum's work uh, on uh, practice and on contradictions and morris comfort's book dialectical materialism gives a very comprehensive understanding of uh, Marxian dialectics in a simple language and um, it is something which uh, uh, most of uh, the students uh, and scholars uh, uh, read. In India, I find uh, Shibdash Ghosh work some aspects of Marxism and dialectical materialism. I found it interesting as it explains in a simple language how developments in quantum physics revalidates the postulates of dialectical materialism. You can find this book in if you google it. If you like my lectures, I request you to watch my other YouTube lectures uh, uh, on Marxist political theory. You also inform like-minded friends to like, subscribe and recommend this channel lecture series in political theory. After a short gap, I will come back with uh, lectures on contemporary political theories. Thank you very much. See you soon.